Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. How exciting is this? I don't even have words. <laughs> Want to know what I got to do for the last few days? Just watch your Instagram. It's so good. I actually had to stop watching because then I was like, you know, there's too much to talk about. Mm, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see and, you. And obviously all I really want to talk about is fatherhood and how cute that baby is and how lucky that baby is. I did love, this has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, but it probably does. You know, I did love the, that social media, you know, it's like we're friends. And then I just think this is the only part of social media I love is how much I get to be in your life you know, when you're across the country. I loved that part about when your wife was pregnant with your daughter and how reflective both of you were, I probably start crying about how reflective both of you were about how much you um, were, had both done your own work to bring mm. a daughter into this world that your wife's mm. crying. Um, that was so beautiful. And just the privilege that you take in parenting and parenting a um, biological female is just so beautiful. I mean, I know that about you, but wow. My wife is an incredible mother. Yeah. You can incredible. tell that. Incredible. Yeah. And we it's just have two love people energy. who really thought it out, mm. <laughs> you know, like not we everybody waited. has that luxury, but like yeah. you're two people who are like, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do this best? Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank so you. how is it? How's fatherhood? It, it's everything everyone promised and more. I really do get the um, uh, heart flutter. Mm. I get to see the, uh, it's it's the smiling and the laughter phase and the yeah. noises of ecstasy. And we have a happy baby and she actually goes into happy baby pose, the oh. yoga pose. And I'm just like, there it is. <laughs> that's why they call there, it that. That's why they call it that. <laughs> yeah. She's just, she's getting strong and, you know, ahead of the curve. That's great. Congratulations. You got the bomb breast milk over here. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I should have your wife on the show. I don't even know anything about your wife, but I'm really a fan of hers. I had, I have eczema, mild eczema. And it's one of the reasons that I have to be particularly intentional about my food, huh. right? Because yeah. there are foods that give me low grade inflammation that leads to eczema symptoms. And uh, yeah, a few months ago, it was pretty bad. And then I just had a light bulb and I said, I'm going to put some breast milk on it. Stop it. I swear <laughs> it got better. This is why I love us. I'm not even at intuitive eating or artificial sweetener. And I'm already astounded by what we're talking about. What <laughs> foods did you stop eating? I have consistently tested on the MRT test, which is the one I use clinically, the mediator the, release test. Oh, what is it? Yeah. There's a lot of food sensitivity tests out there that have sort of a bad rep. They use a single biomarker, the IgG. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of false positives. A lot of dietitians tend to use the mediator release test, hmm. which measures the volume of inflammation across all possible mediators. Oh. So it doesn't identify which mediator is active, mm. but it does very clearly identify that there's something going on. And it's a cool test. You know, I, I, it has the potential to be very triggering for people. It huh. seems like food sensitivity tests create a list of foods not to eat. Right. And so yeah. I'm very uh, intentional about who I would uh, approve it for and mm. oversee. Mm. But yeah, when people have skin issues, headache, migraines, gut issues, or just have unresolving symptoms of inflammation, um, it does seem to be a wise approach. And the best part about the, the test is that it tells you all the foods that are very minimally reactive. Right. So it, right. as a result of you know doing the blood work, you can see these are all the foods that I should be eating more of, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you know just what to cut out. So it has a food positive spin to it. Ooh. Um, and you know someone like me uh, managing something like uh, mild eczema symptoms, I'll get retested every nine months and see how how the needle moves on certain foods. You know, so oh, like that's so example, smart. Yeah, I'm there curious. Was a time, yeah. I'm curious about um, everything. I'm curious about 
I, I know I have my own answer, but I'm very curious about yours about why, what you think happens when people, I mean, first of all, obviously my eating disorder is like, I want to go do that. I have nothing's wrong, sure. Sure. <laughs> but I'd like to go do that right now. What do you think of that? And why are you saying that some people shouldn't do it? I think if someone has a high level of cognitive rigidity and carries a lot of emotional charge around food, it can set up a lot of feelings of failure and disappointment. Hmm. And I think that if someone were to eat a food that was uh, m minimally reactive, but maybe it came up as a yellow and they got in their head about it, the stress of having done something that they thought they weren't supposed to do can actually be worse for their health than the actual food itself. Hmm. You think through some nutritional or some working bit cognitively that people can work through that though? Yeah. I think with good counseling, if someone has, you know, a history of food rules and a lot of uh, uh, impairment and distress associated with eating, that uh, I would be in a position to help guide someone through that yeah. to, to do it with sanity and with big picture thinking. Yeah. And to get out of that kind of crises management type of eating. It is really overwhelming. I mean, on an aside, my dog, I test my dog had a lot of gut issues and I tested him and he's, and when I, I, I actually sort of mean this, he's sensitive to everything. I mean, mm -hmm. and I saw that list and my first thought was, I can't do it. <laughs> it's not even my food. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I can't do it. And then I was like, um, a, what if it heals him? B you actually know exactly how to do this, Molly. Like right. it just takes a little, and by the way, gut totally healed. Right. Go me. Yeah. Hella dog mom over here. I love that. So this is such an interesting thing we're talking about because gosh, it's like, wouldn't it be true that our intuition would tell us if something was highly inflaming us? One would hope that body wisdom would be able to show up with all the answers, but it turns out with certain types of inflammation, someone could be eating a food that's causing issues and never know it. I love the idea that you like, you know, like that us weekly thing, like nutritionists, they suffer too. Like, but I really do have so many thoughts and concerns about intuitive eating and the sales pitch on intuitive eating. I mean, honestly, the way I understand intuitive eating, and it's not how I read the book. That book's quite good in many ways, Indeed. especially given that there's a whole chapter on the end of that book on emotional eating and the difference between mm -hmm. emotional eating and intuitive eating, which is never something you hear as you're scrolling through Instagram, having nutritionists say this very polarized concept of what intuitive eating is. But I'm curious, like how you actually think food sensitivity and intuitive eating, like, like what happened or what do you think about intuitive eating in general? I just want to hear that. Well, one of the nuances that I like to add about intuitive eating is that, and this is missed by the book and the messaging is that it can also include intuitively know, knowing what foods to eat less of. Yeah. Right. And, and that's sort of missed in the model. I think it's a fantastic model that helped a lot of people drop out of diet culture. I think it works really well for people that don't have full blown eating disorders that had just like gotten into some, 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 some dieting ways or body dissatisfaction. And it's a great way to make peace with food and, and with body. Um, but it turned into an advocacy movement and it, it linked up with other movements and they all became associated and it started to feel like there was uh, crusades against other efforts, right? right? And I always try to say that, you know, science is about dialogue, not mm -hmm. about consensus. And so in that group, and I consider myself to be a part of it, there was a lot of consensus going on. They're like, this is where we stand. This is how we see other issues. And if you don't see it the way we do, you are not with us, mm -hmm. right? And right, a lot right. of people that have more gray area nuanced thinking felt like they had to pick a side. And a lot of people felt like if they didn't pick that side, that they would be canceled. Oh, I mean, I, my, my friend, um, was on the show. She's my second guest. I'm like blanking on her name. And it was right after Will Cole's intuitive fasting came out 
And she was like, Molly, I can't come on your show. The whole show is about this. She said, I can't come on your show because I, I can't have people think that I am pro food addiction. And I'm like, I said, wait, I think what you would say, which is I'm not pro, who's pro food addiction. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's a kind of like, I'm not, I'm a food addict and I'm not pro food addiction. Like what is happening here? And I, I love, I love what you're saying, which is that it became an ideology. I'm, I'm interested why, wh where you think the, when you're saying people with eating disorders, maybe intuitive eating, not for them. Can you walk us through that? I mean, there's a lot of data to suggest that eating disorders have biological underpinnings, right? Whether it be, first of all, I don't like the term eating disorders because then you lump them all into one category. Ugh. That's like Crazy. my biggest yeah, problem. I'm here right? for that. Eating disorders is all one thing, right? Oh, right. No, uh, it's yeah. like, please. I honestly, this is the greatest correction of my life. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I need it's that area where nuance is needed. Mm, extremely. What would what would you say instead for that question? Like a range of eating disorders, or I like to think about things as continuums and spectrums and mm -hmm. think about heterogeneity and the variability that exists as people move through the lifespan and all the different possibilities and the constructs that converge and make a whole world of possibilities rather than a predefined diagnoses. Love that. Marsha Linehan, who created DBT would be all over that. She doesn't let you use one diagnosis anywhere ever. She That's would just right. say, what do you mean by that? That's right. She would be really rude about it in this very validating way. If I said to her, you know, well, eating disorder, she'd say, what's that? I don't understand. What do you mean by that? So when you're saying that intuitive eating may not be recommended for somebody who struggled with their eating, or some people have struggled with their eating. What what do you mean by that? I think this is a very freeing conversation for people. I I don't know about you. I don't know who you follow. I wish I could start a whole new Instagram account. I would just follow dog trainers, you know, you and go. babies eating lemons. But currently that's not what my feed is telling me. And my feed is always telling me that sugar is not addictive. My feed is always telling me I should be able to eat what I want and that I'm bad if I'm not eating everything that I'm wanting all of the time. And I love your takes on some of it, which is just factual and informational. Can mm. you help me through it? So, yeah, I think that a lot of my uh, interest academically in the last few years has been in trauma in the first 18 years, early life adversity, and how that can become biologically embedded. Mm. And we know that uh, uh, trauma legacies can play out in the immune system with inflammation it can affect people's guts. It can change people's brains. So if someone has a significant trauma history that's unresolved and they're more likely to uh, be prone to addictive processes, mm -hmm. I think that is a perfect example of someone who would have a much more difficult time with intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack the why of it? Because I have 15 questions off of that. So you're saying that inherited trauma comes into our gut, which means that we're susceptible at birth or by events happening in our life, we're susceptible to having a propensity to being addicted. And then in those ways, tapping into intuition may not be as easy as it's written. Correct. And I think the primary mechanism that would override intuition would be alterations in the reward pathways. Mm. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests that there are biological pathways through inflammation. Perhaps the inflammation starts in the gut. It's a, it's a chronic stress response. And it can cross the blood brain barrier. It's called mm -hmm. neuroinflammation and it can change the brain. There's also the more behavioral linkage where people learn to self-soothe. If they have trauma symptoms and they're dissociating, they're going to learn to use things like highly palatable foods to reduce the negative affect. Yeah. The brain is going to assign it more value, right? And that's how addictive processes begin. So I've made the argument that intuitive eating is perfect for the person that doesn't have a lot of trauma history, doesn't have gut issues, doesn't have inflammation, just is sort of a a, a, a product of diet culture. Mm -hmm. But when there's a lot of biology involved, you can't assume that the body is going to be working at optimum. So you have to heal the body first. Mm -hmm. And guess what does that? Food, stress management, recovery, huh. relationships. So if we're, I mean, 
I mean, just to have my nutrition consult today. Um, <laughs> but I think that really tracks for me because my, I, my father died very traumatically. And when I was three and then my mom said, I was like, I mean, and I know this intuitively also, like I was about the food, the, like the minute I found that out and I was like hiding food and hoarding food and not carrots, you know, and I'd be at the party and I'd be like sneaking the cookies, like half of my life I can associate with like sneaking highly palatable, sugary, flowery processed foods. And so you're saying that's not a person who from the get-go. That's right. Let's talk about that though. Yeah. Cause what I, what I mean by the get-go is that my first, in, my first, um, intervention won't likely won't be successful if it's intuitive eating. And I guess, what do I mean by successful? So help me through this. Yeah. I think that the first sort of, uh, phase of trauma treatment and recovery is stability, mm. consistency. Oh God. Right? I want to hug you. Yes. yes. Boundaries. Yes. Limits. Yes. Mm. And so once someone gets into some consistency with food and builds out some consistency with life, eating regularly, balanced meals with all the food groups and spend some time doing some healing work, the intuition can show up over time. Yes. I love and that. And that could include a lot of different things. And so intuitive eating is beautiful. The, the major problem I have with it is that the leadership came out and said, food addiction doesn't exist. And that's the only bone I have to pick. It's a pretty big bone. It's a big bone. It's a big bone because it doesn't take into account big food and that food is created, the highly processed food is created for us to want more. But what are your thoughts on food addiction? Let's go to the other side of the panel because I know that you have feelings about that not everybody's a food addict, as do I biodiversity. I've been really enjoying thinking about food addiction as more of a public health issue. Hmm. Thinking about it as a kind of global epidemic uh, mm -hmm. related to ultra processed foods mm -hmm. and how that has been changing reward expectancies and changing human behavior and contributing to spikes in other addictive processes. So we have more stress, trauma, and adversity in the world. We have more uh, internet addiction and gaming and, and, the, and the phones and the highly palatable food and, and the inattentiveness and the impulsivity it's all on the rise yeah. concurrently, right? Right. So I, I think that looking at food addiction as a population level issue has a lot more fruitful endpoints than discerning like this person is a food addict and this person isn't mm -hmm. because everything's on a continuum and on a spectrum anyways. But do you think that there's a case to be made that people eliminate processed foods to restore neurological balance or something like that? Yeah, I, I make the argument that for one person, um, uh, getting rid of ultra processed foods is the key to intuitive eating. Right. And then for the next person, eating cakes and cookie and ice cream is the key to intuitive eating mm -hmm. because everyone's a little bit different. Yeah. God, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so interested in this next piece that I want to get to, which is... How do we figure that out? I mean, what I know from, you know, listen, I wrote a book, Breaking Up With Sugar, has so much literature referenced in it, right? There's so much data to support my argument in Breaking Up With Sugar, which for, which is to say that for some people, that may be a really great starting point to some freedom. By the mm -hmm. way, part three does say humble eating, go try some other things. Love Not it. everybody. People get to the food plan and then they're like, I'm done. And I'm like, no, that's a diet. You got to finish the book, please. But the other thing is that the book Intuitive Eating has tons and tons and tons of literature references that supports their argument, which leads me to ask you, if I was sitting and listening to this, I would be pulling out my hair because I'm sure this happens in your practice. This happens every day in my practice. Just tell me what to eat. Right. Just tell me what to do. So what do we do when there is data that is supported on both sides of this argument? Like what is a struggling person to do? I think that people in our uh, positions need to have the curiosity and, and not, not necessarily have the answer right off the bat. I've been doing a lot of functional medicine training and really thinking about creating timelines for, for people's lived experience. And I think when we think about 
food addiction, eating disorder, substance use disorder, family history of addiction, and start thinking about impulsivity, other chronic health issues, that it can be very helpful to put it on a timeline, to think about like which of these things came first, right? Mm -hmm. If someone had chronic dieting behavior in their teens, and they went in and out of eating disorder treatment for restrictive eating, and then they're having food addiction symptoms later on in life because they're underweight, I would be less inclined to say that person has a clear signal of food addiction. Me too. Yeah. But if someone- can we say why? Can we say why? I think that the food addiction symptoms could be a relic of their deprivation right. and restraint, right? Right. If that the restriction is, is actually pretending that it's a food addiction. And the food addiction is also a self-reported phenomenon, right? You ask someone, you know, do you experience loss of control? And some people- they perceive a lot of loss of control. It's like the famous someone reports a binge and then for someone else, that was just a snack. You know what I mean? Yes, totally. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was it? That, that was pint? your binge? Yeah. Like a pint? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the timeline's important. If someone had, you know, no dietary restraint and there was, you know, substance use disorder early on, in and out of treatment, food addiction symptoms, and then later on, the dieting came, maybe they were purging to self-soothe uh, from, from trauma or something. You would be able to say this is a more clear food addiction signal mm -hmm. rather than a dietary restraint right. eating disorder signal. Well, it's a, I think the shame, and I don't even know if there's a better word. For, I mean, the shame is that you get into these polarized treatment models where nobody's willing to look at the other side of it. And that's... Well, that's the answer to your question. Like, what do we do? We don't pick a side. Yep. You, you create tailor-made hybrid approaches that link together different models, right? I learned in statistics that uh, uh, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. God, that's good. None of those models are right. Food addiction model is not right. Intuitive eating is not right. If you can pull together intuitive eating, mindful eating, some food addiction science, pull in some nutrition for mental health, some gut health, some functional medicine, mm -hmm. and be able to pull it all together and meet someone where they're at biologically mm -hmm. and their psychiatric profile, you can really make a difference. Yep. I get to honestly say not to say like, I'm no poster child because I like, but I think that's literally how I live my life now. But I couldn't even eat a piece of Ezekiel bread until I had like four years off of sugar and flour. I mean, I was, but I think that's, and I hear a lot of people, I don't know, like say to me, like um, this very restrictive food addiction model, like weigh and measure everything and know nothing, like all, and that they say, you know, that, that really works for me. And I'll say something pretty irreverent. Like usually people aren't talking to me when things are working. Right. And it's hard to know because a lot of people would interpret something that's working if they have a lot of body dissatisfaction and they're losing weight. God, so I that's, love you that's so where much, things Dave. get I love really you. confusing. Can we say that one again? Yeah. Can you say I that? Think, like, can yeah. you say it in seven different languages? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. When you entangle food addiction with weight loss, it's hard to know because a lot of people prioritize weight loss as their primary outcome. And they're going to choose whatever path leads them to more of that. And yeah. they're not going to look at, you know, other factors, risk factors, the potential for binge eating later on in life. And so I think that's the major argument against food addiction is that uh, it can come across as a, 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 a way for people to just get rid of more food to lose weight. And so, well, yeah. yeah. And the answer to somebody's screaming question, tell me what to eat when you're, when you're responding to that with extreme rigidity, I mean, you're, you're giving them the golden ticket. You're saying, okay, well, you got to weigh and measure and only three times a day. And if you go over your back, like that's a dream come true to that urgency, right? right? The dream come true. But I think what you're saying and second half of my book, what I'm saying is like, yo, we got to like, look at the long game. We want to decrease dependency on gurus. Like, you know, you are like the, the architect of your own. How would you help some, like, how do we help people get there? And I also do want to talk about nutrition for mental health and all this other stuff that you're talking about. I think that someone wants a meal plan. Right. They're like, they I want. need a food plan. Okay. Well, tell Forget me about what to eat. Chatting. Tell me what to eat. And I might start off with the question of like, okay, how many times are we going to eat per day? Let's start there. Okay. You know, three, four, five, six. Right. And then once you have that, let's start thinking about what 
time roughly you're going to eat. But what if they said to you, you tell me? Well, I would respond with the question, what time do you wake up? Okay. And what would you, yeah. like, what would you suggest if I say, okay, I wake up at seven? This is fun. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of seeing people eat within 30 minutes of waking up. Are you? And so you're, not, you're not into like the 11 to eight um, intermittent fast thing. Why mm, not? Not at all. Love that. Yeah. Why, why not? What, why, why don't you like that? I think food is the solution. And I think more of it is what's going to bring- I think you're the solution, if you don't mind me saying. But tell <laughs> me more. The food is the solution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like, I think it goes back to some of the bias around weight. People like to feel empty. They like mm -hmm. to feel thin and light. So if I can get a few hours of lightness in the morning, people want it. And then they're overeating later on in the day and can't seem to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Why not get the body going? Mm. Get some amazing food in. I like to see people eat breakfast before drinking coffee. Whoa. Yeah, I know. It's my, a hard head, sell. my head might fall off. It's a hard it does, sell. Just keep talking. It's a hard sell. <laughs> yeah. Why though? Are you pro coffee? I'm not pro coffee. You're anti coffee or you're coffee ambivalent? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I would not say that I'm coffee agnostic. Uh huh. Uh, I think I'm biased there. I think I have you, a bias there because you drink it because it's like one of my, you know, most severe persistent addictions and I'm so much happier off of it. Mm -hmm. And so like, I have a bias against it, yeah. but I don't let that come into my practice. Right. Not I'm not going to tell other people not to drink coffee just because I have less anxiety when I don't mm -hmm. No, I, I that's I a fact that. in my life. Oh, I'm in, um, I'm currently in contemplation of uh, breaking up with coffee, but I've been in contemplation for like two years. Contemplation is pretty miserable in its own way to be sitting, knowing something isn't good for you. And yet not really understand that you could give it up. Luckily I've had that experience with cigarettes, alcohol, sugar, flour, so many things, but I'm just trying well, to love myself through this. <laughs> well, I've given up coffee a hundred times. Oh, have you? That's so, yeah. I just love everything about you. Okay. Well, someone I'll... could say, someone could say, if you've given it up a hundred times, that means you've never really actually given it up. Cause I, I wouldn't, come back. I wouldn't, uh -huh. I would say, thank you for being human doctor. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Breaking up with coffee. I've, I've been saying this for, I say it probably every fifth podcast I talk about it. So okay. you think it's like a big deal in my head or what? Um, Just to be okay. clear, I'm like a four shots on ice in one sip kind of guy. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I yeah, remember yeah, yeah. the last time you were on the podcast is when you were finishing your dissertation and you're like, Molly, all I'm doing is drinking coffee. I just, I mean, I just love the flawed character more than life itself. Cause it just allows for all of us to be flawed. That's, that's right. why I love your eczema story. Like, oh, he has to do some work too. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news. So back to this idea, um, I guess I think you and I feel so strongly about this, which like the thing is, here's the problem I think you're up against, I'm up against, which is when somebody comes to you, you're like, hey, I'm not your guru. We got to find it inside of you. And that's going to take some time and thought. Right. And then they can just go to this like weight loss coach and they're going to be like, eat this. And if you're not, if you can't do that, you're the problem. Mm hmm what are we going to do? <laughs> like, so the, so I believe what you're saying is the solution. It's the long game. It's yes. getting in touch with yourself. It's treating your, your relationship with food on a comprehensive, sustainable level. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're in the midst of, you know, morbid obesity and not being able to stop eating, you know, getting that response is really dysregulating. It's really upsetting. So like, what's, what do you have advice and, and how to find people? And like, I don't know, but this is what you and I talk about all day, but talk us through it. Cause I, think I do, help I do a, a lot of sort of re-education on assumptions that are made around weight. I think people still do assume and they could look at someone and get this information that they can choose what they want to weigh and that it's up to them. And it's a matter of personal responsibility. And I think a lot of people believe that that should be true. And the data tells a different story. So say, say more. So you're basically like, well, I weigh five, I am five foot seven and I want to weigh 130. David, make me weigh 130. Right. By that, the way, you'd have to like remove, you'd probably have to remove like a few, I don't know, probably my liver and a few, um, ribs if I were ever to weigh 130. 
for whatever it's worth. Yeah. I don't even really engage those kind of demands. I would, I would hope not. I would lose. I'd be like, okay, so we're done. Um, right. But what do you, but yet you have to validate them in some way. Sure. So how do we get someone to move out of that mind frame? Like it's, I'm only good. If I weigh this, you're only good at your job. If I weigh this. Yeah. I think the, uh, suggestion or the invitation that I would offer someone is like, let's focus on improving your relationship with food and see what the universe has in store for your body. Okay. Let's lead with recovery. Let's lead with food. Let's lead with healing energy and, uh, uh, see what happens and let's be patient. I truly believe that the stress people have about living in a body that doesn't feel like home is the driver of the eating. 10. And it's also the driver of the not releasing of the weight. Like don't That's underestimate right. the power of cortisol. Like That's right. cortisol is meant to protect us in trauma. It's not going to release weight. Wait, you say more about that. That's your expertise, but yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I see. If someone has a lot of conflict, I call it a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy between what their mind wants to weigh and what their body actually weighs. Mm. That discrepancy could be 200 pounds, but it could also be three pounds, right? Yes. As long as that discrepancy exists, there's internal conflict, there's conflict around food, and it changes the physiology of eating. They're living in fight or flight. They're not in rest and digest, and it doesn't allow the healing to occur. I just think we should repeat that um, and have that be the podcast. There's just 18 things we should, but yes. I mean- and it's, I have to say as someone who's been in a 325 pound body that I didn't, that I knew wasn't mine, I don't know that I could tolerate that. So I understand. like, what do we do? Like, I just, I would want to, I love you. I want to dear friends. It's like, I just would want to punch you in the face if you were saying that to me. So it's like, how do we help people get patience, right? It requires patience. How do I get patience? That's what I'm looking for too. That's my <laughs> major defect in this world. I Me am an too. impatient person. I want results quickly. I want things to happen fast. And it's a difficult sell because our brains are more wired for immediate rewards. We don't even have the patience to watch a full movie anymore. We're scrolling through social media during a movie because it's not stimulating enough. Oof. Mm -hmm. Preach. It's the brain. It's right. the way the brain has changed in our world with technology and food and the, 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 the entire environment that we live in favors convenience, mm -hmm. favors ease, right? The brain assigns right. values to things that are rewarding and easy. Mm -hmm. And that's what people are looking for. It's a hard sell to say, let's be patient. Let's do healing work. Let's set you up for long-term success. Right. Let's get you to a place where you never need to see another nutritionist ever again. Yes. I have the chills. Yeah, I think that's right. Ooh, I don't even know what to say about that. Can you talk about artificial sweeteners? I mean, I need to talk about that. Wait, I want to pause on the artificial sweeteners. I just want to, let's just close this out. I just need to hear what you have to say about it because I'm just having so many conversations with people. So we have to really lean in to the world we have around us versus the ultimate goal that we want. And so when you're talking about eating for mental health, can you say more about that and give me some like really hard skills that I can start to eat for my mental health? Yeah. I mean, it's a broad term mental health, right? Um, I've always been in the world of eating disorders and addictions, but those cluster and co-occur with depression, anxiety, trauma, ADHD, and more, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so really when I think about mental health and nutrition for mental health. It's really three areas. One is the gut first and foremost, right? The gut and the brain have bi-directional networks of communication. And if the gut isn't functioning properly, the brain isn't functioning properly. Lots of pathways and we won't even get into the mechanisms. The other one is nutrients for the brain, period. B vitamins, omega-3, things that are needed for structural integrity of the brain and for optimum communication, neurotransmission, et cetera. And then the other one that I'm really interested in, and I know that you are too, is how we think about food. Absolutely. That is mental health. If someone's in their head about food and body all day, that's a mental health problem. It's also a, it's also a tone eating disorder for those of you restricting right now. That's right. You can free up some of that energy. I tell people they want, people want measurable outcomes. I do ask on my intake. I collect a lot of data at intake. Shocking. What percentage of the day do you uh, 
spend thinking about food and what percentage of the day do you spend thinking about your body? Someone comes in and they're like 75, 80 and they're, they want some measurable outcomes. And I'm like, let's get those under 50. Mm. Let's spend a, a month together and get the noise down. And that's a measurable outcome that will in, improve your mental health quality of life. That's and someone's true. like, okay, let's do well, that. And I think it also heals what we were talking about before. You know, I'm just sorry. I'm just bringing my like 325 pound self that wants to lose weight. So I'm just helping a sales pitch for it. But it's true if you can decrease the obsessional thinking that you can get the fight or flight cortisol down also. Like when we can decrease urgency, we probably can find wisdom and get a, a little bit more done, if not a lot more done. I love that. What happens with the gut? I just need like a, like when you say gut health, what do you mean? The the major things that I think about are intestinal permeability. What's that? Um, it's, you know, a lot of people have heard the term leaky gut and yeah. that's, you know, a uh, uh, somewhat controversial term. The more medical term is how permeable the gut lining is. And it's not like a, a leakiness that would allow pieces of food to get through. We're talking about microscopic particles smaller than the bacteria, the genetic material, the LPS, very, very, very uh, minimal um, uh, uh, space in the tight junctions allows for things to enter the bloodstream mm. that shouldn't be in the bloodstream, right? Yep. And they can go to the liver, cause inflammation in the liver, uh, travel to other parts of the body. I'm most interested in their ability to uh, uh, travel to the brain. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hot topic and that's really linking nutrition and mental health yeah. and, and the whole world of, you know, the gut bacteria, the presence of different species and how some of them might be competing with each other. And I'm super intrigued by the idea that the bacteria themselves can be responsible for craving signals Oof. that the bacteria have their own needs and there's an arm race for their own survival and they are feeding off of what we eat. And it's a, it's a pretty uh, interesting topic. They've, they've done a couple studies and it's, uh, it's fascinating. And it, it goes to the artificial sweetener question. I knew right? it. I knew we yeah. were going to get there yeah. naturally. Yeah. Why is I just want to say that addicting? xylitol is poisonous for dogs. Like you have to take your dog to the emergency room if it consumes artificial sweeteners. Now I want to hear what you have to say. I mean, let's start off with the question, why is Diet Coke so addictive, right? Right. It, it can't just be the caffeine. <laughs> no. It can't I just actually, be the caffeine. I, yeah, that's true. Right. It can't just be the caffeine. No. There's more going on. Is that what people on. say about it? That's amazing. Dissonance is fabulous. I mean, if you look at the ingredients, it's zero, 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 and some caffeine. Yeah. How could someone be so addicted to Diet Coke? People are very right? addicted to Diet Coke. And I don't, I'm not going to say this with certainty. I'm just going to pose it as a question. Is it possible that gut bacteria that thrive off of artificial sweeteners have proliferated and are colonizing and demanding more artificial sweeteners so that they can stay alive? Civil war in your gut. Who knows? Is it possible? I think so. W or with the stevia that you're putting in your morning coffee. So one, one thing is gut health. The reason that, you know, so, cause you did this great post about this and you said the thing that I think people are not talking about enough is artificial sweeteners. Why do you think we're not talking? Well, I think we're not talking enough about it because we don't want to. <laughs> right. Cause they, that's a great marketing campaign they did in the eighties to make us believe it is better for us to eat artificial sweetener than it is to eat like cane, like a natural sugar bonkers. It's based on the calorie model, oh, right? The calorie nice. model and the macronutrient model would generate that conclusion. Such but deep we, misogyny there too, by the way, I mean, that's a different topic for a different day, but anyway. When you bring in new models, like the gut health model, the nutrition for mental health model, the argument doesn't hold. Say more. I'm just finishing my coffee. <laughs> there you go. What's in it? What's Nothing. in it? This is okay. half and half. <laughs> I've been, you know what? I have to tell you that when I stopped, it was the last thing I ever broke up with was artificial sweetener and the profound impact it had on every area of my life. Mm. Crown chakra to root chakra is mm -hmm. beyond anything I could talk about. And I am, and again, 
I've, I've broken up with alcohol, drugs, like there's, and, um, and the thing I want to say most of all about that is it was the thing that I swore I would never do. Well, except for coffee. And I, I do think there's some spiritual link there, right? That the mm-hmm. thing you sort of know you have to give up. I mean, we're just making my case for coffee, but we're talking about artificial sweeteners. This case where I was like, I just, I can't have yogurt unsweetened. Like, that's just not a possibility. Like, I can't put, like, my, like I need the sweet in my coffee. And when I did it, it was, it was challenging, but mm-hmm. oh my God, the rewards are yes. endless. And I'm so grateful to be off of artificial sweetener. Like that bind, it was on, on thing. And, and my hunger levels. And I don't even know. I mean, I wasn't in touch with my gut at the time, but oof. But same thing with hunger levels, right? It messes with your hunger cues. Absolutely. You're tricking your brain, right? It's like, if you're in a relationship, you're sending mixed messages. Oh, say more. Mixed messages between the gut and the brain. You get a, you get a signal in the mouth, right? It doesn't actually register in the brain. And now the communication network is off and people are confused, wanting to know what's going on with the other person, right? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a different, we could have a different that's systems biology, right? It's also really, yeah. It's also attachment disorders. Internal also family systems. Yeah, right. so, you know. <laughs> I'm having so many feelings about yeah. this. <laughs> but the, right. The one so thing the that, most, go on. Yeah. The one thing that we tend to know for sure about gut health is an area where there's a lot of disagreement is that the optimal environment in your gut has a wide range of bacterial diversity. Mm. That's across the board. And the data that we have on artificial sweeteners show that it decreases bacterial diversity. So you lose out on beneficial microbes, right? Wow. That's wow. just science. So even if you're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, all the things we know help with gut health and you're taking a probiotic and you're doing like everything and you're drinking two diet Cokes a day, those two diet Cokes, sorry, the artificial sweetener and those two diet Cokes are probably going to impact what you're trying to do for gut health in those moments. It's hard to say uh, when there's a lot of positive things going on, how how they balance out, but I would say probably, yes, there are negative effects. But the biggest negative effect is the reward expectancy from food and the recalibration of the sweetness. Mm -hmm. I I wholeheartedly agree with that. I wholeheartedly agree with that. That that you cannot appreciate any sweetness when you're eating this processed sweetness. Uh, a strong correlation between people who use a lot of artificial sweeteners and don't eat any fruit. It's just yeah. a nightmare waiting to happen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and when gosh. you get off the artificial sweeteners and get some good quality fruit and it tastes amazing again, oh, now you're in recovery. That's great. You know, I'm such an apple. I feel like an apple is such a luxury when I eat it. Mm. I, I mean, I feel like such a lame ass saying that, but that is actually what I think. Well, I um, am going to public because I like, I'm obsessed with you, as you well know, in a healthy way, in a healthy way. I'm going to be um, publishing this podcast, like the minute that we're done with this. So um, I'm curious. So we're moving into, so this podcast will go on like this, I don't know, like the ninth of November or something like that. And um, I'm curious what kind of advice, I know that's not a word you probably take well, but like, what kind of like tips can you give us about this like holiday season? Right. Cause that's a tricky, it's like our tax season right now, us eating disorders, <laughs> mental health professionals, like it's tax seasons. We're awake. We're alive. We're here to help. What, like, give, give me some tips. I'm psyched yeah. about this. I'm getting my pen ready, by the way. It's, it's such an, an important question. And I, I gotta be honest, I've been the dietitian that has had uh, sessions on the week of Thanksgiving, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and not even brought it up with people before I have. And oh, the reason, really? the reason is because I think I, I shouldn't say everyone, but I think we tend to have a fear response based on negative past experiences. And then we can start to expect things to be difficult. And that can actually be a risk factor for difficulty. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy that we're saying, well, it's going to be really hard Thanksgiving. So, yeah. So, so I need to make a really big deal and plan double and right. And so what about people who are walking into really challenging situations though? Do you think there's a key? I mean, I just think of CBT behavior rehearsal, things like that. I mean, do you think there's a case to be made for that too? The solution is food eating food, Wait, breakfast, more. you know, Have breakfast, breakfast. Like um, I tell people, it's like, I, if the meal's at three o'clock, 
That's a third meal of the day. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. I'm you with you. You know what I'm you. saying? Oh, yeah. If the meal's at 11 o'clock, you better be eating dinner. And you're saying right. to your family who's That's just right. binged their brains out, uh, well, I didn't binge my brains out, so I need to have dinner and I need That's to have right. my afternoon snack. That's my life. This yeah. is mine you know, my dance space, not yours. It's another meal that fits into the context of a whole day of eating. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love that. It's Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> Timing of your meal might be different. The <laughs> ingredients and the energy and the, and the family and the cultural legacy be, it might be a little bit different, mm. but it's just food and it's just another meal and let's enjoy it. Amazing. What about like all the other holiday things going on? The parties, the this, the cookie things, the cookie swaps. Like, do you have any tips on that? I mean, you're such a good little behaviorist. Um, what are your tips? You're good on tips. Thank you. Yeah, you're good on that. You give tips. No, very, like, I think like, if we're comparing, I'm like, so into your Instagram. I mean, every we'll get to that, but everybody should follow you on Instagram. And also you're so engaging. Like my tips are really kind of like that you want, I believe wholeheartedly in behavioral rehearsal. I believe in having guiding principles because guiding principles can answer the questions that you need answered in the moment. So if That's my right. guiding principles are peace, integrity, and love, and I'm like, I'm at a cookie party. I want to take a bite of this cookie. It's like, is it an integrity? Does it bring me closer to love? Does it help me feel abundant? For me, those answers are no. They might not be for someone else, but I think you in, internally, you have to have your relationship goals in order when you're walking in somewhere. And sometimes I think, um, have some skills ready. And I always think have a loose idea of what you are going to eat and what you're not going to eat. Mm -hmm. Because I think the worst thing is to walk in ill prepared or, um, you know, so scared that it looks like cocksuredness, you mm -hmm. know, because that's when it happens. You're right. Like when your brain is like, I don't know, uh, or I'll figure it out when I'm there. I'll figure it out when I'm there is a fear response, I think. Because mm. I don't know. I would never go to a safari and be like, I don't know. I'll figure out like what I'm wearing when I get to Africa, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'll get the I shots like when I'm there. <laughs> like, And as someone that studies the neurobiology of addiction and has really spent a lot of time understanding ultra processed food addiction and all the other biological systems that are at play, I would make the argument that, um, and this is maybe departing from a lot of the more bio biologically reductionistic ways of thinking about food addiction, mm -hmm. that a cookie in a place of conflict, uncomfortability around family members, um, underfed, Right. In well, underfed's secret, a big one, Dave. A big underfed's one. a big one. In secret, underfed. Yeah. Right. Is a very different biological experience than a cookie in a place of harmony, joy, and, and being full fed. Those are different experiences. Preach. I said this, I say this all the time. They're like, I, you know, I want to eat a macaroon in Paris. I'm like, well, if you're going to. Can we do it in the most loving, appreciative, yes. like yes. mindful way possible? Yes. Yes. I believe in it. I believe in it. I just could talk to you all day. But yeah, I think that's exactly like, because, you know, oh gosh, I was thinking about this idea today in the shower. And I was like, when people say, am I allowed to have this? And it just grits me. Because it's giving me power and it's even giving food addiction power. You're allowed mm -hmm. to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. There are a few freedoms left <laughs> while we're here. And that, I just, that's what ends up happening is that we talk about trauma, right? We go back into that parental, at least for me, like, no, you can't. Yes, I can do whatever I want. That's right. When I start from that point in my own recovery, I can do whatever I want today. Now what's best? And that's one of the uh, principles of intuitive eating that I think can be modified for Me people too. with food addiction is Me give too. yourself unconditional permission to eat. Sometimes it's the permission that matters and then you could choose to eat it or not eat it. Yeah. But the permission is what creates the uh, uh, emotional fluidity and the adaptability to the circumstances. Well, my version's humble eating, which is knowing what works, knowing what doesn't, and then, you know, acting in accordance. Because mm -hmm. I think for me, I still do. I mean, I still would want cookie dough in the morning and, and that doesn't, or maybe if I was emotionally dysregulated and I woke up in the morning, I wake up in the morning, emotion, very emotionally dysregulated. I would want to stuff my face with bagels and cream cheese, but after, you know, some work on myself, I'm like, okay, 
cottage cheese and Ezekiel bread it is. So here's my question at your incredible place in your life, right? Oh, After doing a lot of healing work, having yeah, a work lot on 13 years, can I just say? There you go. Having a lot of professional success and in, in, incredible relationships all around you. Tell Do me. you think <laughs> that the the cookie dough has the same pull that it did when you were at 325? No, it doesn't about. have a pull because I have so many blockades. It's almost jo it's it's comical to the desire is comical to me. The desire is like, and I think the desire if I can, if I'm in my highest and best self, it's more of a siren. Like what's going on that you want to go to the market right now and eat all the granola? What's happening for you? What do you need? That's a lot. I mean, but David, might I say, I do have a hardcore meditation practice, hardcore prayer practice, super supported longevity and consistency with eating food. I mean, that year one, I've been like, that's why I needed a, I needed a lot of structure in the beginning, a lot, a lot, a lot. And, and, and I balked at getting out of the structure. And when I got out of the structure, my spirituality grew all the things. Yes. I guess I am in many ways, the poster child of what we're talking about. Thank you very much. And I saw Hard your work. morning routine on Instagram. It was amazing. <laughs> that was one part of it, if we're being honest, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I like to try to do three things every day. It's, you know, for me, and I'm sure we're the same on this level. It's like, I just, I need to remember that like something bigger than me is taking care of me. And I need to do that in a very formal way and tell all of my stuff, like it can all chill and something's bigger is with me. Okay. I will admit that my morning routine has changed ever since having a baby. Yeah, but that is but looking, I mean, <laughs> that's a, that's a sometimes practice. I go on Instagram to look at your baby and that's my morning routine. That's a gorgeous, not to say, I'm sure her insides are beautiful, you know, but God, that's a good looking kid. You guys got yourself there. An angel. Okay. So we're obsessed. Let's fight. I mean, you'll come on in a few months. Don't worry, everybody. Dave is just like, part of our team. Uh, but if we want to know more about you, where are all the places we can come and visit you? Yeah. Dr. David Wiss is the handle. Um, very active on Instagram. I'm on some of the other social media platforms as well with yeah, the same TikTok. handle, yeah, you're you know? TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. have to say your Instagram is so wonderful. It's like, it could be a coping skill for somebody. I could say that could be a coping skill. It's so smart. Like you. Yours is a lot of tools too. I'm oh, impressed. Crazy. Tools. Us. You're just giving tools. That's gems. what I'm here for. Just yeah. here to report the news. Um, and, and then I have another Instagram at Wise Mind Nutrition. Yeah, it's a good app, one. Which is coming soon. And there's a website, wisemindnutrition.com. A lot of blog articles. I'm actually redoing the whole website right now. So it'd be mm -hmm. really exciting. I can't wait to relaunch and spread the news with the world. We have an app that is designed to help people eat deliberately and intentionally mm. specifically for mental health without mm. being math centric. So no calories, no macros, fully qualitative approach and the beauty of it. And there's a free version that includes a food log and some, some videos on uh, uh, my framework and cooking and meditation. It's a full deal. It's a full oh, treatment I'm, program. Okay, well, yeah. I'm getting on that now. That's amazing. I'm so happy about that. And it, you know, people can work individually with you too, right? I mean, do you have space? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. good. I mean, virtual work listen, with people all over the world. Let me tell you, that is one of my top recommendations when people are really struggling. I'm like, this is the guy I'd go to. Um, well, I adore you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank There's you. a lot. This is a pen and paper episode. I mean, I hope people listen to this more than once because this thing is really helpful. So um, thanks for coming on the show, my friend. We did that. Thank you so much. Adore you.